Um, so next up, we've got Taylin Mel. So um, he's looking at the use of antitransference for mitigating the impacts of smoke exposure to wine grapes. And I'll just let him get his presentation on the screen. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, everyone. Viewing online or attending in the audience, my name's Taylin Mao, and I'm going to be talking to you about smoke taint. So, what is smoke taint? Smoke taint is developed in wines when grapes have been exposed to major smoke drift events, often occurring from a bushfire. So, cases of these can be seen two years ago in Tasmania, where the Human Valley fires led to an estimated $2 million of crop loss for growers in the area. And the fires at the start of this year, leading to an estimated $100 million of loss, and the current state of emergency in California estimated to have a major effect on the wine industry. So, in smoke taint, the development of undesirable aromas, often described as ashy, medicinal, smoky, and burnt, make the, make the flavour of the wine often undesirable for anyone to drink. So, the reason behind this is the exposure to key volatile organic compounds that are derived from burning lignin from wood and other vegetation. So, and the phenols that have been characterised to the flavour of wine have been outlined as guacal, 4-methylguacal, syringol, 4-methylsyringol, and the cresol groups. These are the same compounds that are responsible for your flavours from smoked salmon, cured meats, and smoked ham. However, they do not have the same desirable effects in wine due to the complicated phenol mixture present in the wine. So currently there are mitigation strategies to reduce the effect presented by these phenols. So the use of chemical fining agents and reverse osmosis have been used to reduce the amount of smoke paint in the wine through um, fil filtering out the phenols and, yeah, in both um, mechanisms. Um, and however, these are not desirable in high quality wine as they are not selective for smoke taint phenols and therefore can often reduce the quality. And the other method you often use is reduced skin contact or complete removal of the skins as the majority of the phenols are found in glycogen conjugates in the cuticles of the grapes. So a cold maceration technique can also be an effective method. However, all of these are answers to a problem that's already occurred. So what we wanted to do is look at preventing the uptake of smoke-related phenols prior to harvesting the grapes. And so last year there was a paper published by the University of British Columbia, and they found that the use of an anti-transparent biofilm reduced the uptake of VOCs by up to 237%. And However, in this experiment, they completely submerged the grapes into the anti-transparent. And so therefore, we wanted to take this information and look at this product along with competitors of the product and apply them into, in a way that is accessible for growers and that they can use in the field. So from here, we developed these research questions. So does smoke taint influence the presence of compounds associated with smoke taint, can the use of anti-transparent sprays mitigate the effects of smoke exposure? So we, ha we had it down to Home Hill in Ranala, who were kind enough to donate some of their grapes for our experiment, and we applied four different treatments. So the first two being Parker and Rainguard, who are, who are products who, uh, that are often used in the cherry industry for anti-cracking and um, ameliorating stresses of the environment. We also used a proprietary product that is currently in development based on the results from the paper published last year, and water was the basis of our control. So we applied 7.5 litres of this to our vines um, to run off at the company's recommendation concentrations. These were then left overnight to polymerise, and we returned the next day to harvest our grapes. We then transported the grapes to our smoking chambers that were off-site as we could not, the risks associated with bringing smoke into a vineyard were too great and therefore we had to do it off-site. 
So we applied our grapes to either one or two smoke densities. So the first one on the left being our low density and then our high density on the right. And we left these in the smoke for one and a half hours. We then went on to our wine making technique where the grapes were hand pressed and left to ferment on the skins for two and a half weeks. We used a rehydrated RC212 yeast and followed a standard Pinot Noir wine making technique in French press bodums. So when studying smoke taint phenols, it is extremely important that we analyse both the free phenols in our wine and the glycoconjugate formation, so the phenols that are binded to our sugars. So to do this, a sample has to be taken from both the wine and wine that has undergone a strong acid hydrolysis at a high temperature to break these bonds and release these glycoconjugates into their phenol forms. So from here, we, went, we under took two methods of extraction, so the first being a solid phase extraction using ethyl acetate and a vacuum chamber through polarised cartridges. And second, our second method that we used was a liquid to liquid extraction using a two to one mixture of pentane diethyl ether. We then took our samples and ran them through using gas chromatography and mass spectroscopy to semi-quantify our smoke tank VOCs. Additionally, we ran a full modified Sommers technique to compare our winemaking wine -making procedure and to other wines and to ensure our quality of our wine was up to standard. So to do this, we ran a potassium bitartrate buffer with acetylaldehyde and metabisulfate measured at 420 and 520 wavelengths. And our wine samples in a HCL solution measured at wavelengths 250, 270, 280, 290, 315 and 520 wavelengths. So this measures the phenolics, our tannins, our anthocyanins, our pigments, our colour density, our hue, the chemical age indices, titrated velocity and the pH of our wine. So what results did we find? We were only able to quantify one of our target VOCs and that was orthocresol as our other target VOCs were below our limit of detection. We were able to validate this through our spiking of samples with known concentrations of glycol and recovering them using our GCMS techniques. Doing this at different concentration allows us to develop a limit of detection and a limit of quantification, which is roughly three micrograms for glycol. So that means that while we did not, we weren't able to detect it, it doesn't mean that it is not present in our wine. So we found that smoke density showed a significant difference between our low density treatment and our high density treatment. And however, this was not as significant as what we might have first seen, thought. Um, and this was probably to do with how we made our wine directly after smoking our grapes and didn't leave our grapes long enough in the smoke because in a real event of a bushfire, the grapes would be left on the vine after the smoke incident, incidents before harvest. And our treatments, while showing a significant difference between treatments of our sprays, um, we however did not see a significant difference when compared to water, our control, and therefore cannot say that it had any effect on our orthocresol levels that we found in our wine. So with our SOMS method, we attempted to correlate our orthocresol levels with any of our observed results from our SOMS method. However, we found no strong correlations and therefore cannot assume that there is any marker or any evidence of smoke taint from our SOMS method. We did, however, observe significant differences with our smoke densities for anthocyanins, with anthocyanins, with high density of anthocyanins being very similar to control, and our low smoke being um, having a significant difference. We did not expect this to happen because the fact that we smoked post harvest, and therefore we don't expect anthocyanin production to continue after we've applied our spray our treatment. And therefore, this suggests that there is interference and an overlapping of our smoke tank compounds at our wavelengths resulting in our anthocyanin data. We also found that the hue indices were 
significantly different, with our low hue being similar to the control and more of a brick red colour, suggesting that it is an older wine, with our, and our high density having more of a purple hue, and this is attributed to lower to younger wines. And this may be evidence of the preservation me mechanisms of smoke in our wine. So in conclusion, we found that a higher smoke density increased our orthocresol levels in our wine, but due to our smoking restrictions, this led to a lower than expected VOC concentrations. We would have liked to analyse our VOCs at different labs as evidence, as papers show that there can be an extreme difference of quantifications from different labs, and we also would have liked to do this on the vine. However, with the risks associated, we weren't it wasn't going to be a possible situation that we were going to be able to go through. And finally, our sprays did not mitigate the ocresol uptake when sprayed onto the fruit. However, there is evidence shown that when completely submerged and having full coverage of the fruit, that it does prevent the uptake, does mitigate the uptake. And we cannot say that this didn't mitigate the uptake of the other VOCs involved in smoke taint. It's just for orthocresol levels. So my recommendations for the industry, if growers experience a major smoke drift event, would be conduct, to conduct a micro-fermentation approximately two weeks before harvest and analyse your aromas and flavours and detect any smoke taint from the flavours yourself. Or take a juice sample and send them to a commercial service like Vint Essentials or to AWRI and they will be able to quantify your smoke taint in your juice and provide any recommendations to harvest from there. A few people I'd like to acknowledge for my project, so the Tasmanian Wine Show and Terry Bennett and Home Hill and my supervisors and everyone involved in my experiment for their guidance and direction along the way. And thank you. Thanks very much. Fascinating. So does anybody have any questions for Terry and Be good. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't able to conduct a sensory analysis as it is beyond the scope of an honours project. Um, however, through personal taste, which I was allowed to do and smell, <laughs> they were not very nice. You could definitely taste the hints of smokiness and the smells in the wine. And yeah, they were, there was definitely signs of smoke taint through the sensors. However, we weren't quite able to quantify that fully to the extent that we would expect from the taste and smoke. Um, and this is an issue with smoke taint altogether as different quantifications doesn't necessarily mean there's more smoke taint, so a higher level of phenols is not always associated with a higher effect in the taste. So there can often be really low levels that they would deem safe that come out in the, after, being fermenta ferm after fermentation to be tainted by smoke. Anybody else? So that was something that we were more going to look into if we'd had success with our anti-transparents. Um, I do know one of, our, one of our treatments that we used had, does get used in grapes in a small, similar ca small cases for external weather and it's, in, and it's reported to have no effects on the smoke wine. However, I can't say that to be the case for the other treatments we used. Um, However, I would expect because they're natural products and degrade relatively quickly that they would have no influence over the final smoke, the, the final wine aromas and flavours. Yep, so you're talking about smoke? Yep. So smoke does have multiple pathways into the grape. So um, the higher concentration of phenols is through the cuticle of the grape. However, there is translocation in small amounts through the vine canopy. So in the case of the smoke, you would have to completely mitigate the effects of the smoke. You would have to apply it to the grape, to the vine, as well as just the grapes. However, it is a lot smaller concentrations that's translocated through the, um, through the canopy than just the grapes alone. I think Adele had a question. So there has been surveys done with consumers about the different levels of smoke taint in wine. And while the majority of people, even in extremely low cases of smoke taint, tainted wine, 
say that it's undesirable. I think it's about 80 per cent. There is about 20 per cent of consumers who don't mind the taste in wine in the low density. Um, however, most, in most cases, it still is for uh, someone who is trained wine taster, it still has these notes that are completely undesirable due to the, just the ashiness that comes with the um, phenols involved. Yeah, so in the case of a bushfire, a nearby bushfire, the smoke has to be relatively new as phenol levels in wine are not uniformly concentrated in smoke. So therefore, in that first bit of smoke, there is a lot higher concentration of the phenols. And so in the case of a bushfire and you're monitoring during that season for a bushfire being a grower, if you see one that's in the proximity of your vineyard, if they, in the hypothetical case that they do work, um, it would be to apply immediately. And however, the, the concentrations have not been, what to do is have not been outlined yet due to it still being a relatively new area scope of study. Um, and if they worked and were able to confirm that these antitranspirants did have no effect on the wine, I'm sure growers would have no problem taking any measures they can to be involved to stop the uptake of these phenols to do a smoke tank. Thanks very much. I want to thank Taylor again.